Okay, now we're moving to what would usually be considered the height of the Roman Empire. Now, Rome in the early days of the empire actually stopped short of conquering all of Europe. Uh, basically, Germany proved, or what is now Germany, proved more trouble than it was worth when three legions, that's about 15,000 men, were ambushed and massacred in the Teutoburger Forest in 9 AD. So that basically stopped the northeast uh, European movement of the Roman Empire. The frontier was pulled back to the Rhine, which was a defensible frontier. But elsewhere, modest expansion continued under Augustus's immediate successors, who were usually referred to as the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Uh, most notably, Rome conquered Britain by CE 80. Now, the Julian dynasty was succeeded by the adoptive emperors. I'll talk more about them in a moment. For the most part, the adoptive emperors were content to maintain the territorial limits of the empire. Uh, but there was a big exception, and that's Trajan, who ruled from 98 to 117. You'll see these dates in a minute. Uh, he conquered the troublesome Dacians on the north shore of the Danube, what's now the area of Romania, Hungary. Uh, and in 114, he went to war with the Parthian Empire. This was Rome's rival to the east. This was the empire that basically succeeded the Persians. Uh, he defeated them. He annexed Armenia in 114, northern Mesopotamia in 115, and occupied southern Mesopotamia all the way to the Persian Gulf in 116. Now, this was as large and powerful as the Roman Empire would get. And in fact, particularly that expansion in the east uh, under Trajan really did not turn out to be sustainable, but we won't worry about that till we get to our last lecture. Uh, so here's a timeline. Uh, so in 68, Nero, who was deeply unpopular, one of the probably crazy emperors, but also the last of the Julio-Claudians, committed suicide. There was a civil war, and out of that, the commander of the Eastern armies, Vespasian, or Flavian, to use his family name, emerged victorious. Uh, the end of his fairly short-lived dynasty in 96 was followed by almost a century of stable and capable rulers that are referred to as the adoptive emperors or sometimes the good emperors. They're called the adoptive emperors because each one adopted his most promising subordinate as his, as his successor. This may have just been good fortune, good fortune in that none of these men until the last actually had a surviving son. And so they had to adopt someone else and they went out and found someone who was capable of running the empire rather than someone just related to them. Uh, this is the time that Gibbon, who's probably the most famous historian of the Roman Empire, called the period in the world during which the condition of the human race was most happy and prosperous. Now, this is uh, writing a couple hundred years ago, but still, this was a good time. The population of Rome reached maybe 500,000 at this point, which was by far the, made it by far the largest city in the world. Uh, during this period, the provinces flourished as well, and with that prosperity came a pretty widespread acceptance of Roman rule. Now, this was helped by the fact that the Roman Empire gave a clear path to citizenship uh, for its most able citizens, admittedly, usually its most able upper-class citizens, whatever the land of their birth. Uh, there were exceptions, of course, and one notable exception was the Jews, who revolted twice. Both of these rebellions were brutally crushed, and the Roman army sacked and destroyed the Great Temple of Jerusalem. We'll see more about that in a minute. Uh, it's also worth noting that while the urban elite enjoyed increasing prosperity uh, in the Roman Empire, high taxes, high rents, and the demands of military service made life in the countryside less economically secure. On the other hand, slavery was increasingly replaced with tenant farming, which you could argue was kind of a form of slavery, but at least involved somewhat more personal freedom. Starting with Hadrian, the empire's foreign policy moved from expanding Rome's frontiers to defending them. So Hadrian, for example, is famous for the wall he built between Roman Britain and barbarian Scotland. So back to art. The greatest works of these periods are really architectural, either public buildings or monuments to Roman emperors. Uh, of these, the Colosseum, which was built by the Flavian emperors, is probably the most famous. Uh, it was constructed of barrel vaulted corridors that held up a huge oval seating area the size of a 16-story building today. Uh, it could seat 50 to 80,000 spectators. The outer shell was covered by travertine, which is a stone, but the huge building was made possible only with the magic 
magic of concrete, which is the interior was basically constructed with. Uh, as you'll see on the bottom left, the decoration involved engaged columns bracketing arches. Uh, from bottom of the building up to the top, the column order changed. So there was Tuscan on the first level, and you see that in the right-hand corner, then Doric, then Ionic, and finally Corinthian. You know how to identify all of these, right? Doric, I mean, Tuscan is very similar to Doric. Uh, it has a base. Doric usually does not, uh, and is quite thick and sound. Again, part of supporting the uh, you know, very heavy weight of this building, even made with concrete. Um, next to that, by the way, or, the, or up on the top, you see the brackets that held the valerium or sunshade. In a minute, you're going to see a video that gives you a sense of how that worked. Uh, this is just a diagram of the seating. As you'll see, the lower seats were the higher class seat. Uh, the upper balcony, as today, was where people who couldn't afford a good ticket went. Uh, and this shows you basically the lower levels and the place where the wild beasts were caged. Again, you're going to see more on this. Uh, and here we see some pictures of the interior, including the tunnels and rooms under the arena. Uh, and I have here, if you're watching this online at this point, I recommend that you go uh, to the short video on the Coliseum. Lots of fun scenes of uh, gladiators and lions, but it also has some good descriptions of the construction of the Coliseum. And besides, it's fun. Uh, Vespasian, the first Flavian uh, emperor, was a down-to-earth guy, or at least as much of a down-to-earth guy as any Roman emperor could get away with being. Uh, on his deathbed, he said to have ridiculed the practice of deifying emperors. He said to the people gathered around, alas, I think I'm becoming a god. In other words, this is the end. Uh, in the same spirit, he broke with Augustus's tradition of having ever of portraying the emperor as ever youthful and kind of idealized. Uh, and under his reign, and his immediate successors, there was a return to verism or realistic portraiture, although maybe not the really exaggerated old age and wrinkles of the Republican period. Uh, it's interesting that we can pretty much always tell which emperor uh, a statuist, when one is discovered, uh, is representing because their faces were depicted were, you know, pretty reliably from sculpture to sculpture, and we think that's, at least in the periods when, we were, when the Romans were following the very tradition, probably a pretty good sense of what they actually looked like. Uh, this portrait bust, on the other hand, shows an idealized female beauty. I thought it was interesting that uh, sculptors used a drill rather than a chisel to create those amazing curves. But again, this, is, this I think, harkens much uh, more back to the Greek sculpture and its idol idealization, but get that crazy hairdo. Okay, this is a big one. The Arch of Titus, constructed, uh, in fact, by Titus's brother Domitian to commemorate what? Uh, Titus's conquest of Jerusalem. I mentioned the Jewish revolt. Uh, so what are spandrels? There they are. Uh, they're the decoration between the arch and the engaged columns. And like pediments, they pose some challenges for sculptures. And you'll also see, again, the composite columns. You have Corinthian columns engaged, bracketing the arch. Again, this engaged column style is a, it borrows from the Etruscans and is typical of Roman architecture. And one of the ways in which it differs from Greek architecture is something you should probably be aware of. Okay, this is the single most famous panel from the Arch of Titus, and it shows up on at least two and maybe three AP tests that I've seen. Hint, hint, hint. Uh, it's one you need to know, and it's really easy to identify if you recognize the seven candle candelabrum or the menorah of Jewish tradition. Know that. Know this panel. It's very important. You're very likely to encounter it on the test. And besides, it's a very cool freeze of a genuine moment in history. Uh, we have a pretty good description of this event from Josephus, who was a Jewish historian. Uh, and it appears as if the relief sculptures on the Arch of Titus are actually fairly realistic. Uh, and this is the other big panel uh, on the other side of the passageway. And this shows Titus and his triumphal chariot. Now, this has more symbolism. So you see that kind of see down at the bottom, the bare-chested youth. Uh, he 
we think represents honor, uh, whereas the female leading the horses is a personification of valor. So again, more of the kind of symbolic use that you see in, in Greek statuary. Uh, I'm actually going to stop here and continue with the height of the Roman Empire. I still have to get to the good emperors and their very important works, works of art and architecture. Uh, but we've covered a lot, and I think there's going to be plenty of time to get to them in our final lecture.